This tutorial will create a Raspberry Pi based audio spectrum analyzer using a bicolor LED matrix and a Holtec HT16K33, which is a very powerful I2C LED controller and matrix key scanner. This inexpensive chip adds a ton of capability to the Pi and is very intuitive and easy to set up. This will be a quick paced tutorial, but all the code, notes, and updates are available on my website, rototron.info. There'll be a link in the description. This video will demonstrate how to connect a Holtec HT16K33 to a Raspberry Pi and use it to drive a dual color 8x8 LED matrix. In addition, it will show how to use a voltage level shifter to power 5 volt devices from the Pi with I2C communication. The Spectrum Analyzer is written in Python and will use ALSA, which stands for Advanced Linux Sound Architecture. ALSA is used to play the music and the Python Wave library is used to read Wave audio files. Finally, one of my favorite libraries, NumPy, is used for quick FFT calculations. Here's an HT16K33 breakout board I picked up on eBay for a couple dollars. It can drive 128 LEDs and it can scan up to 39 input switches, all this while using only two GPIO pins. It has 16 row pins, A0 to A15, and 8 column pins, C0 to C7. The rows connect to LED anodes and the columns connect to the cathodes. It uses multiplexing to light up eight groups of 16 LEDs, such as a 16x8 LED matrix, or eight 16 segment alphanumeric LED displays, or 16 seven segment numeric displays, which have eight LEDs, if you include the decimal, or a bicolor eight x eight LED matrix, or any other similar combination. Here's a SparkFun two inch by two inch dual color LED matrix. It'll be used for the Spectrum Analyzer's display. It has 64 bicolor LEDs, green and red, if you turn on both LEDs simultaneously, you get yellow too. It's a perfect match for the HT16K33 because it has 16 anodes for the 16 rows, 8 red plus 8 green, and 8 cathodes for the 8 columns. Thanks to I2C, we we'll only need 2 GPIO pins on the Pi, which is much better than the 24 pins that would be required if we connected directly to the Pi. Plus, the HT16K33 handles the 8 cathode multiplexing for you, which saves system resources and coding time. LED matrix and segment displays come in common anode and common cathode. Either all the LED digits share a common anode or a common cathode. For the HT16K33, you'll want the common cathode variety, such as the SparkFun model. Adafruit also sells a smaller square LED version. For an 8x8 single color matrix, it doesn't really matter because the anode and cathode count are equal, but for most LED displays, you'll want to stick with the common cathode when using the HT16K33. The SparkFun display is very bright, but does use a bit of power. The HT16K33 can run at 3.3 volts, but that was not powerful enough to light up the bicolor matrix properly. It needs to be run at 5 volts. It's prudent to use a level shifter to protect the Pi's 3.3 volt data lines when working with 5 volt devices. It's also important to use a level shifter that supports I2C. I'm using an Adafruit bidirectional level shifter with 4 BSS138 FETs and 10K pull-ups. They also make a great TXB0104 based level shifter, but it's not compatible with I2C. This one has four I2C safe channels for shifting voltages between 1.8 volts and 10 volts. We'll use two channels to shift between the 3.3 volt Raspberry Pi and the 5 volt HT16K33. For the wiring, a 5 volt pin from the Pi will be connected to the higher voltage pin of the level shifter and to the VDD pin on the driver chip. All three devices will also share grounds. A Pi 3.3 volt pin will be connected to the lower voltage side of the level shifter. GPIO 2 and 3, which are SDA and SCL, will be connected to the level shifters channel 1 and 2 on the lower voltage side. The driver chip, SDA and SCL, will be connected to the shifters channel 1 and 2 on the higher voltage side. That's all it takes to connect the HT16K33. Connecting the HT16K33 to the dual color LED matrix is very straightforward. The 16 row pins from the chip connect to the 16 anode pins on the matrix, and the 8 column pins connect to the 8 cathode pins. Rather than use 24 jumper wires to connect the matrix, I thought it'd be cleaner to mill a simple PCB for this demonstration. All the row pins on the HT16K33 are connected to the corresponding matrix row anodes, and all the common output pins are connected to the corresponding matrix column cathodes. A 4-pin header exposes the ground, VDD, and the two I2C data lines SDA and SCL. Per the data sheet, I added a 0.1 UF cap, but it's probably not necessary because this breakout board already has a cap. The Holtec breakout board plugs into the bottom female headers. 
the dual color LED matrix plugs into the top headers. A small breadboard is used to facilitate the wiring. The Adafruit I2C safe logic level converter is placed on the board, lower voltage side facing the Pi. The level shifter HV pin is connected to a breadboard rail, which will be 5 volts. The shifter's ground pin is connected to the ground rail. A three-wire jumper connects the Pi's 3.3 volt SDA and SCL pins to the shifter's LV, A1, and A2 pins respectively. Since the Pi's SCL is connected to A2, I'll connect the driver chip's SCL to B2. The Pi's SDA is A1, so the driver's SDA will go to B1. The shifter sits between the data lines and performs bidirectional logic level voltage conversion between the four A pins and the corresponding four B pins. It also serves to protect the Pi's GPIOs, which could be damaged if exposed directly to 5 volts. The 5 volt rail on the breadboard is connected to VDD on the driver chip. The ground rail is connected to the chip's ground pin. The 5 volt pin on the Pi provides power to the breadboard's 5 volt rail. And finally, the Pi's ground is hooked up to the breadboard's ground rail. Okay, we're good to go in terms of hardware. On the Pi in a terminal, I use sudo apt-get update and sudo apt-get upgrade to ensure I have the latest software. I also recommend that you perform a fresh install of the latest version of Raspbian and Jesse. For this video, I'm using a Raspberry 3, but the code should work on earlier versions too. sudo apt-get install is used to install the necessary Python libraries, Python dev, Python imaging, and Python smbus. The Python ALSA audio library is installed and will provide audio playback. Git clone is used from the home directory to download the Adafruit Python GPIO library. It's used by the other Adafruit libraries to interface with the Pi's GPIO. CD into the downloaded Adafruit Python GPIO folder. Run sudo python setup pi install to install the GPIO library. CD back to the home directory and use git clone again to download the Adafruit Python LED backpack library. It provides lots of code to control LED displays. CD into the Adafruit Python LED backpack folder. As before, install with sudo python setup pi install. Next, I2C needs to be turned on. sudo rasby config to open the Raspberry Pi software configuration tool. Scroll down and select advanced options. Select I2C and yes to enable the interface. Hit OK and finish to exit. Don't forget to reboot the Pi after this step. After restarting, I'll use GKSU to open idle with super user permissions, which is necessary when working with the GPIO. Most of the code in the video was downloaded from the internet. The program went together very quickly. It literally only took a few minutes to get it up and running. The ALSA Python wrapper that we installed earlier is imported. It'll be used to play the audio. The Python wave library is loaded. It's used to open and read the wave file. Unpack is imported from struct. It'll be used to convert the audio data for NumPy. NumPy is imported. It can perform very powerful calculations quickly on n-dimensional arrays. A bicolor matrix 8x8 class is imported from the Adafruit LED backpack library. A bicolor 8x8 matrix display is instantiated. Begin initializes the display. The display is cleared, and the brightness is set to 7. You can pick any value from 0, which is dim, to 15, which is blindingly bright. A spectrum list determines the color thresholds for the frequencies. 1 is green, 3 is yellow, and 2 is red. The lower three LEDs will be green, then three yellow, and the top two red. Matrix will hold the current frequency levels, powers for the amplitude spectrum, weighting scales the frequency data to the display. The audio setup is all boilerplate code. A wave music file which I already placed in my Pi's music folder is opened. The sample rate and number of channels is determined. Chunk sets the number of frames of audio to read at a time as a string of bytes. It should be a multiple of eight. An ALSA audio output is set up. This will pipe the music to the Pi's audio outputs so we can hear it. I didn't write the next two functions, PIF, which returns a power array index corresponding to a particular frequency, and calculate levels, which returns a list of audio frequency amplitudes to display. Props to Juliana Penna. I got the code from her blog, julip.co. Unpack converts the raw audio data to a format compatible to create a NumPy array. I'm not going to go into the FFT math because NumPy does the heavy lifting for you. Basically, NumPy applies a fast Fourier transform to the audio data to extract the average amplitude levels for the eight specified frequency ranges measured in Hertz. The frequency data is formatted for the matrix display and returned. The main program loop reads the wave file audio data one chunk at a time and continues until the end of the song. Output write plays the music. 
The calculated levels function is called to generate the audio frequency spectrum. The LED matrix display is cleared. 4Y loops through the eight specified frequencies. 4X loops through the amplitudes. Display set pixel draws a pixel at the XY location on the LED matrix. Spectrum X determines the pixel color, green, yellow, or red. Nothing is actually displayed on the LED matrix until write display is called, which presents all the pixel data to the display. Wave file read frames gets the next chunk of audio data and loop repeats. Okay, I'll save the program and run it. I hope you found this video helpful. I'll probably make another one showing how to use the HT16K33 for keypad inputs. Being able to read 39 input switches in addition to 128 LEDs lets you create very feature rich projects. I really appreciate all the positive feedback and suggestions. I try to answer all questions and keep the code on my website current. You can support this channel by subscribing and leaving a like. Thanks for watching.